Welcome to Gambling with an Edge with your hosts, Bob Dancer and Michael Shackelford. Bob Dancer is America's premier video poker writer and teacher. He's in the Video Poker Hall of Fame. And he has written 10 books, including Video Poker for the Intelligent Beginner and the best-selling Million Dollar Video Poker. He helped develop the Video Poker for Winners computer software. Michael Shackelford is the force behind the website's Wizard of Odds, Wizard of Vegas, and Wizard of Macau. An actuary by profession, Michael has been analyzing the whole gamut of casino games since 1995. His Wizard of Odds website explains the best strategies for 140 different casino games. Michael is also the author of Gambling 102, the best strategies for all casino games, and is a former adjunct professor of gaming math at UNLV. The goal of the show is that, by listening, you will be a more knowledgeable gambler tomorrow than you were yesterday. And now, here are Bob and Mike. Good evening. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. My name is Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Our guest tonight is Nathaniel Tilton, author of a new Huntington Press book called The Blackjack Life. Munchkin reviewed this book recently on his website, richardmunchkin.com. Michael Shackelford was swamped with other projects, so for one night only, Munchkin is substituting for Shackelford. Many of you remember that uh, Richard Munchkin formerly was co-host of this program for about six months. So, Munch, welcome back. Happy to be back. Good. Happy to have you. There was an interesting one-day tournament in Macau recently where the buy-in was $2 million Hong Kong, which is a little more than a quarter million dollars United States money. One interesting part of uh, this was that each player had an optional full-price rebuy opportunity so long as the total of his chips was no greater than his starting position. Now, in Arnold Snyder's books, he always recommends making the rebuy immediately. That is, buy in for double chips for a half million dollars before the first cards are dealt. Of the 73 players entered, only 21 made the rebuy total, whether it was immediately or after they busted out. This seems surprisingly low to me, although it's easy for me to talk about somebody else making a, an extra quarter million dollar buy-in. So, Munch, uh, do you have any thoughts on this? Would you have yeah, made that? I, uh, I, I mean, I agree with Arnold, and it seems insane to me to, uh, to not, if you can't afford the rebuy, then you, I don't think you should be in the tournament. Um, and and it, I would be curious, you know, of the people who did not, you know, buy in for double to start with, I'd be curious how many of those considered themselves professional players because you're just putting yourself at a huge disadvantage to have half a stack against 21, how many, 20-some other players that that have basically double your stack right from the start. And some of them were pretty good, like Phil Ivey and uh, Jason Mercier, and uh, some you know the best. Now I'm assuming that those guys though bought in for, I mean, paid the double and got the double stack. Right? Exactly right. So if you didn't, you were at a uh, you had fifty percent as many chips as the best players in the world. Yeah, that, that, that's uh, yeah. a tough handicap to overcome. Yeah, yeah, it just, it just seems crazy to me. Uh, I mean, I can understand saying, well, I don't have enough to. You know, to buy in twice, but then you shouldn't be in that particular event in the first place. Yeah, because um, relatively small number of people cash in this, uh, and so mostly the uh, the for most of the people, the two hundred fifty thousand is lost, or the yeah. half million dollars is lost, and that's just the way it is in tournaments. Most people lose their money, and a few people take it home. Yeah, I, well, I'm sure the pros were really happy with this uh, format where they get to start out with a double stack. <laughs> um, yeah, and it only costs them a lousy extra quarter mil. It's no big deal. <laughs> right. All right. Uh, Savannah State doesn't have a very good football team. Matter of fact, they're pretty lousy. Yet they agreed to play two nationally ranked teams, Oklahoma State and Florida State, back-to-back to start the season. Why? Because they were getting paid 
830-some thousand dollars to do so. Oklahoma State was favored by more than 60 points, which is basically unheard of. But they won the game 84 to nothing. Florida State, which is considered better than Oklahoma State, was installed as a 70-and-a-half-point favorite. It has never been this high. Midway through the third quarter, though, Florida State was leading 55 to nothing, and the game was called because of lightning. Florida State likely would have covered the 70-and-a-half points uh, if they wanted to, but they didn't because the game ended early. So, who wins the bet? Uh, it turns out all bets were returned. In Nevada, the game has to go at least 55 minutes to be official. So, as far, insofar as the sports book goes, this game never happened. This is an obscure rule that you probably should be aware of if you're going to bet on games, which is why I'm mentioning it. Uh, Munch, is it fair to assume that you didn't bet this particular game? Um, I thought Savannah State was a dancer at the Crazy Horse. Um, <laughs> but but I, I will say that, um, you know, there was a, a scam a few years ago in uh -huh. Europe where there's a rule in soccer that if a game passes a certain number of minutes, and then gets called, you know, the result would stand. Um, and there were situations where somehow this syndicate of people were um, cutting the power to stadiums uh, after a certain amount of time in order to lock in their win. Um, and it, it happened in more than one soccer game before they realized that, you know, that this was a, a syndicate of, of, be of betters who were responsible for these games getting uh, these power outages. Yeah, it would seem to get rather suspicious after it happens uh, three or four times. Yes, yes, well, it did, and they they were found out. <laughs> so, uh, Those devious electricians. All right. Um, today I want to talk a little bit about uh, pulling your slot club card. Now, players historically have pulled their cards to disguise their winnings. The way it works is that you have your player's card in the machine when the cards are dealt, and then if you're dealt a good hand, you pull the card, and then the result gets scored. So, But the result is scored when your card is not in the machine. So when you do this, uh, you got full credit for the dollar's bet, but the winnings didn't show up reported to the casino. Now, years ago, this worked very well. Uh, during my million-dollar run at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, for example, uh, the first part of that run was in 2000. And so the 2000 records showed that Shirley and I were down 400000 at that casino. Now, our record showed we were up 250000 So the casino was happy, and we were happy, and the comps kept coming. Now... Players like this, basically, because they receive far more benefits than the casino's reinvestment model wants to give them. Uh, some players do this to falsify their tax return. Many casinos consider this cheating and abusing the system. For the most part, this doesn't work anymore. Modern player tracking systems are not fooled by this technique. Plus, they record it and they uh, give a report back to the casino that you're doing it. Um, as a result, several casinos are actively kicking out players who do this on a regular basis. The reason I'm mentioning this is uh, a, a local casino in Vegas has kicked out a couple players just this last week. Now, bottom line, don't do it. The costs are much higher today than they used to be, and the benefits are less. Now, Munchkin, the uh, table game equivalent to this is rat holing chips. Players slip chips into various pockets to understate their wins or to overstate their losses. How do casinos ask when they catch players doing this? Yeah, okay, so I, I want to say a few things about this. Um, uh, first of all, one of the great lies that the casino tells you is it doesn't matter if you win or lose, it's all based on your theoretical, um, which is horse pucky. Uh, it matters a lot whether they think you're a winning, whether they think you're winning or losing, even on an individual trip. You will get much more in comps if you have a losing trip than if you have a winning trip. Um, second of all, when you say that cons the casinos consider this cheating, um, th th this is the word cheat 
has a legal definition, and and it gets thrown around a lot when uh, people say like, uh, oh, whatever, seeing the dealer's whole card is cheating, or card counting is cheating. Um, when really uh, they may they might mean against my morals or my ethics or something, but when you say cheating, that has a legal definition. So it is not illegal to pull the card, cheating, um, but it's against the casino's rules. And yes, it doesn't work anymore, and casinos will throw you out. So you definitely don't want to do it. Um, now, uh, but on yeah, rat holing but- chips, do they throw you out for that? No, I don't know anyone who's been thrown out for rat holing chips. Um, sometimes a boss will come up and say, do you have chips in your pocket? Or they'll act, or they'll know that you have chips in your pocket and say, would you uh, color up those chips in your pocket? That kind of thing. But there haven't been anywhere near the kind of repercussions to table games players that there are for the slot players. Um, I, I think just because so many tourists do it as well, it's not... So many people just put chips in their pocket, not because they're trying to deceive the casino, but just because they, you know, want to try to save them and not gamble them because they're, you know, they have some set amount they don't want. Yeah, it's their money management below. technique of sorts. Right, right. So, um, you know, the the casinos are aware of it. Um, you know, uh, surveillance does see it sometimes. Sometimes the boss will know just because the rack doesn't add up. They'll see that there are chips missing. Um, but a- as I say, there's nowhere near the repercussions for table games players as there are for uh, slot players or video poker. All right. So uh, let me introduce our guest, and we may ask him to follow up on this, his experience on rat holing. Nathaniel Tilton is a financial analyst who got intrigued by the blackjack story of Semyon Dukac. He attended a seminar offered by Dukac in late 2005 and slowly but surely became inspired to learn the game a lot better. He joined up with D.A., another seminar attendee, and over the next four years developed a unique approach to small team play, which we're going to talk about tonight. His book, The Blackjack Life, explains that system. It reads like a novel, but is primarily a memoir. Nathaniel Tilton, welcome to Gambling with an Edge. Uh, Hey guys, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Good. Now, your system starts with card counting and goes beyond that. You and DA seem to be quite anal about the level at which you mastered counting. Explain how much practice went into this. Yeah, we we like to think that we probably put in more time uh, into mastering counting prior to live action than maybe anyone else ever did before us. Um, but to be honest, our commitment was based more probably on fear than on opportunity. Uh, we really didn't want to be a cautionary tale about you know having just enough skill to trick us into thinking we were ready, but actually be a danger to our bottom lines. Um, we obviously knew that that blackjack, the advantage is so small that we, you know, we'd be ignorant to jump in too soon. So we spent several months working on our skills every day on our own, and we also would meet weekly for practices uh, until we felt like we were ready. But even at that point, um, we wanted to be sure. So we, we reached out to another MIT player, former player, Mike Aponte, for private training. And uh, he offered to mentor us and really took us from having just raw talent to truly being able to put it all together. That's, that's I think, when we knew when we were ready. So that, that entire process took about six months or so. Now, um, did Mike charge you for that mentoring? He did, yes. Um, but we were, we were able to work out a deal with him. Um, but that was more for the initial instruction. Eventually, he, he, um, he sort of took us under his wing because he had – some ideas on building a team of his own. So uh, at that point, there, there was no charging. But, okay, so, so when you started, well, for, before I get into that, this is all very interesting to me. So you first got uh, really interested because you read the Ben Mesrick books, Bringing Down the House and, and Busting Vegas, which was about right. the MIT team, which Semyon right. and Mike Aponte were both a part of. Um, did your thoughts about them how did your thoughts about the MIT team change 
once you actually started working with them and, and, take, and taking class from them? Well, that's a really good question. You know, I think that the, the major change in our thinking was more, uh, I guess, along the lines that we, we started out by trying to uh, mirror them exactly. And the reality was that they had large teams with an endless supply of players, and uh, having those players get burned out was less of a concern for them. Uh, there was always somebody else to fill their shoes. If we got burned out, um, that was kind of the end for us. So their approach was very rigid in terms of how they approached the game and team play and, um, and, and co- the lack of cover, I guess. And we really had to adapt to that or adapt from that over time. Um, so that, that, was, that was the big change. Um, and, and as much as I was fascinated by the story, of, in particular, of Semyon, um, Semyon became more of a, of a friend to me, and it really was Mike Aponte who, who really took our games to the next level. Even though Semyon, gave, you, you attended like a three-day seminar with Semyon? Yeah, it was it was a one day seminar. Uh, we spent the entire day with him, but and that really uh, sparked my interest in in actually even learning the craft. At that point, I attended the seminar just out of pure curiosity, from having read the book and and having this opportunity to meet to meet the guy in the book. We, um, you know, because he, he he and I both lived in the the Boston area, so felt like it was a really good opportunity. It'd be a lot of fun never thought that I would pursue it uh, past that. How does the gorilla big player technique that you and DA used differ from the big player methods used by the MIT team, um, Kenny Houston, uh, and other teams? Yeah, the way, the way I would understand the two roles, is there, there's a distinction between them. Um, the, the big player typically gets called into the game by a spotter. Uh, gets the count and then sort of takes over from there. Whereas the gorilla big player would get called in and in most cases doesn't necessarily take over. He plays based on the spotter's signals. So the spotter really quarterbacks the game. Um, And the the idea is that the gorilla comes in betting big but acts like a gorilla, acts like he's not paying attention to the game. He talks up the pit, checks his cell phone, a lot of times the dealer has to prompt him to wager or play his hand. But out of the corner of his eye, he's always catching the signal from the, the spotter, specifically how much to bet and if he should deviate from basic strategy. So the skill set is really in the hands of the signaler. Um, so I think that we used uh, both, really, in our, in our strategy at different times. So uh, maybe you could describe for the people who haven't read the book yet, the you used a few different techniques um, and combined them. Why don't Why don't you describe what those were? One of them being the gorilla call in. Yeah, the the um, the value I think in in this book is that we we plucked some of the best ideas from blackjack greats before us, and rather than focusing on perfecting just one of those strategies we would try to perfect four or five of them. And in any given session, we would move in and out of those different strategies. For example, we might start by back counting. Um, and we, we had learned to be able to back count up to two tables each. So um, we're back counting four tables. And if a table got hot, I might call him in as the big player, pass him the count, and then myself sit down at another game of my own and then a few minutes later if i started another shoe that got hot i might call him into that game where he might play the gorilla um and then at that point he chatted up with the pit and i'd signal him the moves to make and we might stay for one more shoe and if that count also got good we might switch into a balance betting approach where we we'd bet varying amounts as the count rose but our combined bets would be accurate in terms of our playing advantage. So over a 20 or 30 minute session, we'd have done back counting, uh, big player call-ins, wonging ourselves into games, spotter call-ins with gorilla big player, 
and then this balanced betting. So it was really difficult for surveillance or a pit boss to monitor our play and try to figure out what we were doing or whether we were counting. And um, would, so would your sort of average of length of time in a casino be like 30 minutes, or would it be longer than that? Yeah, I, we tried to limit our sessions to 90 minutes. They, they typically would fall somewhere between 60 and 90 minutes. But over the course of that, that time, in most cases, we would move in and out of maybe two or three ses- two, two or three strategies um, to, to avoid detection. Tipping is generally considered to be cost ineffective for, for professional players. Stanford Wong says the difference between a counter and a canoe is that the canoe sometimes tips. Now, <laughs> you and DA came to realize that tipping was a good idea. How come? Well, you know, the reality is we only tipped on occasion. If we were, if we were playing $100 tables, it might be a nickel here or there but it was always based on a percentage of our hourly EV. At the point in time that we got to use tipping on occasion for cover, we had a really sizable bankroll, and our tips were very minimal in relationship to it. Yeah, It's funny, I've, I've read a lot about tipping, and you know, obviously if done excessively, it kills your, your profits. Um, but people will argue if it's not sizable enough that it looks out of place. And I think that's where I disagree because it played a lot of blackjack and and I'm sure you guys know being in casinos a lot, there are a lot of cheap people at the tables. So even though small tokes might not be great for the dealers, it's still a toke. They still have to wrap it against the table before dropping in the box. It still shows that we're tipping. And I think that there's some value in it if, if not done excessively. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Um, I, so I want to ask you about you. Um, you guys did use players' cards, right? Right. And, and so what happened? How did you deal with uh, once you started getting barred and no longer being able to use whatever name the initial players' cards were in? Well, you, you asked if we use players' cards. You didn't ask if we use players' cards in our own name. Um, the, the reality is that we, we used both um, to whatever extent we needed to. Uh, so initially we would use our, our, own, our own cards, but we had, uh, we had a lot of friends who were willing to help us out and, um, and sign up for cards at various casinos. Ah, Okay. So once a name got burned out, you would just throw the card and start on the next card. Pretty much, which which was uh, much to the dismay of a few of our friends. Right. <laughs> they find out they were burned uh, and they hadn't done anything. <laughs> right. Now, camouflage plays, such as standing on a 16 versus a 10 always, that might be important in maintaining your longevity at the table, but it can be expensive. Now, mm-hmm. what type of camouflage plays did you use in addition to mm-hmm. tipping, which is, which is a camouflage play? And how much sure. EV do you think you were giving up by making these plays? Yeah, it, the, the camo thing came to us very slowly, I think, in our careers. When we started out, our entire foundation was built on playing perfectly and not giving up an ounce of edge. Um, and we already talked about that in terms of, of the MIT teams. We... We both read um, Ian Anderson's Burning the Tables in Las Vegas book, and uh, that sort of changed us forever. And he talked a lot about his ultimate gambit, which included a great strategy for cover plays and cover bets that allowed us to look like regular gamblers, probably with sort of progressive bet patterns. And the strategies cost us very little in terms of overall EV. You, you, you mentioned the 16 versus a 10. Uh-huh. And, the, and the correct play, obviously, is, is to hit. Basic strategy says to hit. Um, but it says to stand at a true count using the high-low count and the true count of a half or higher. So really the mistakes that we were making for cover plays were always at low counts when we had our minimum bets out. Um, and it allowed us to play that consistently 
so that when we were playing higher counts and we had more money on the table, we were actually making the correct plays. But we looked very consistent in the decision-making process. And he talked about that in, in great length and sort of encouraged people to not just copy his list of cover plays, but more as an inspiration or a guide to developing your own cover plays with low, you know, with a, a low impact, I guess, on your EV. So we had our own set um, that worked very well for us. What? Um, how? How about the? Um, I mean, for your technique, uh, no mid shoe entry is a big problem. Mm-hmm. I mean, has has that um, rule? Uh, been changing in Vegas, and and are you find, finding that to be more of a problem, or are you still not having any problems because of that? Um, well, it changed how we how we approached our game. Uh, you know, I talked about the various strategies we used, and I wrote the book starting back in ni- in two thousand nine, um, and our bankroll was much different at the time. As we started to move up, especially in the higher limit rooms and the no Michu entry issue, um, the whole uh, call-ins and back counting became less and less a part of our repertoire. Um, and we started to look for new opportunities that could sort of replace that and still give us a variety of different strategies to use. Um, so I'm actually, I've been writing a, I uh, started writing a column for the Blackjack Insider uh, monthly newsletter. And uh, one of the things that I'm going to cover next week is is what's called the grifter's gambit. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, um, but it's essentially an inverse bet spread um, that allows you to sort of play, play heads up with the dealer, maybe one other person at the table, um, which helps us because we can do that for a short period of time, and then we can move into our other strategies for an extended period of time as well. And we're still moving in and out of strategies, which is difficult for for surveillance to to follow. When you were on the uh, telephone line tonight, but before you were introduced, uh, Munchkin and I were talking about rat holing chips and mm-hmm. casinos' reactions to that. Do you? Mm-hmm. Um, I assume at least some of the times you did this, did you ever mm-hmm. get into trouble for rat holing or have any interesting things you can tell us about that? You never got into trouble for it, and and I think Richard made a good point. Most of the time it was um, you'd see them counting the rack, and, and somebody might somebody else might leave the table, and they would ask the dealer how many chips did he take with him um, just to, to try to keep the, the, um, the, the, the count on that. Um, we never had any direct issues as far as that was concerned, but a really good technique that we had – excuse me, is um, if you have a stack of chips and you place your palm on the, on the stack of chips as if you're going to, to riffle them, but you press down pretty hard, it actually can suction cup to the bottom of your palm. Um, and it, it can stay there for, for a second. So at the end of a shoe, the cut card comes out, the dealer flips over their cards, uh, payouts are happening, and you know that it's the shoe is over. We'd press down on the top of that stack of chips, reach into our pocket, immediately pull out a cell phone as if we were checking our cell phone. Meanwhile, we had just rat holed the chip, and we try to do that pretty consistently. Um, and, and I think the, the more the, the more subtle approach you you have. I mean, if you're if you're putting you know, six chips in your pocket, then they're going to notice. But if you can do it sort of slowly over time, I think it can be very impactful as far as what showing losses. And it's always or reducing your wins. One of the larger chips, you wouldn't rat hold a nickel. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I don't know, uh, Bob. Actually, I've been on games where we've taken three or four hundred and red off the game. <laughs> really? <laughs> um, in, in, you know, in addition to you know through 400 and green and you know depends on the club <laughs> yeah you can uh, between pockets and fanny packs if you're playing with multiple people you can take you can take up quite a few hundred off in red yeah and my, don't, my playing don't track partner, it as my, well either my playing partner wore a fanny pack yeah so that that's true <laughs> <laughs> now uh your hero Semyon Dukach, in the book they utilize whole car techniques 
shuffle tracking, ace tracking, forcing high cards in the dealer hand, other plays. Now, was you don't describe any of these in your book. Is there a reason right. you and DA didn't include these methods in your arsenal, or did you and just didn't write about them? Um, we didn't at the time that, that I was writing. You know, when we first connected with Mike Aponte, we connected with him at a time when we had really just perfected the fundamentals of card counting, and, uh, and we really looked up to, to Mike a lot. And uh, his position always was that there was some suspicion as to the effectiveness of those advanced strategies and just how much success his MIT counterparts had with them. So we just stuck with what we were good at. And at the time, we never really explored those things. That being said, I think that counting alone will leave some EV on the table. So we, we, we started to explore um, other options for us, I think, you know, towards the end of our careers. Um, toward, you mean toward the end of your career in the book? I mean, from what I understand, you guys are back to playing again, right? Or still playing? <laughs> I mean, no, the book think... made it sound like you stopped, but... <laughs> Sounds like a no of... comment is coming. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're retired. We are retired. Okay. You know, one of the things that people... Are you think... likely to unretire next week? <laughs> <laughs> No, no comment. Okay. <laughs> uh, one of the things that people uh, seem interested in the book uh, is your uh, your the your rise from really starting in you know uh, like twenty five dollar betters up to purple chip betters, um, mm -hmm. and but that was not all wind. You had outside investment come in, or. Or was that really a straight rise in 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 win, where it just kept getting shoved back into the bankroll? Yeah, it it wasn't just wins being reinvested, although that was a a significant part of it. Um, but it also wasn't outside investors per se. I think it was uh, family, um, very close friends who who wanted to sort of support us and uh, saw that we were on something special. And um, really wanted to wanted to help out, wanted to contribute. Wanted more, more than that, probably just they wanted to be connected with it in some way. They they were excited about it, and uh, so we were able to build our bankroll uh, into the six figures, um, uh, and, and healthy six figures, and and played a pretty good clip for for a long time. What was the longest? Uh, losing streak you guys had in terms of like number of hours oh hours um or I well, don't know how you measure i mean um yeah we, I, I was talking to to my friend uh uh just recently we we were we were talking a little bit about how we had we had been up pretty big on one weekend i think it was uh, you know like a thursday night we we got into vegas and Immediately, I was up thirty thousand dollars, and feeling pretty good about that. Uh, and proceeded to lose sixty thousand over the next few days. Uh, just could not win. Couldn't win a session. Couldn't win a shoe. Felt like I couldn't win a hand. Um, and went from being just on that weekend alone up thirty to down thirty. And uh, that that tested me <laughs> emotionally. Um, but those, you know, those types of things were fewer and far further between. Um, most of the time, it would just be, you know, uh, we'd be down for a weekend, but it wouldn't have been that significant of a hit. Wow! So you never had like a hundred hour, two hundred hour, you know, months of losing. No, and we were, we were, no, and we were making trips. I'd say that we probably made fifteen trips a year on average maybe every three weeks or so so it wasn't playing how not, many hours per trip uh from landing at mccarran at eight o'clock at night um on a thursday night till uh the red eye home on sunday i mean we would no but i mean playing out. hours yeah i mean it it really felt like the pretty much the whole time I mean, we were either playing eating or trying to squeeze in some some sleep we would get a lot of hours in, and it was all business. I mean, the first time that we went to, to Vegas 
to work and not even, you know, pick up a, a, a beer was very unusual. Um, but that's what it became for us. It really became something that we took very seriously and we worked tirelessly when we would go out there. But we never did have that, that long-term losing streak. Um, we just had losing sessions here or there that, that hurt. Um, but, but we also didn't have long-term winning streaks either. We'd have some wins and we'd have some losses. And at the, the end of it all, um, you know, at the end of our four- or five-year period together, we're up um, a good amount. So it, it felt more like the everyday stock market than the stock market of 2008. Wow. Well, you were fortunate. <laughs> it sounds like you retired yeah. at the right time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, you and your partner approached this as a business, and you wrote out an ever-evolving manual about do's and don'ts. Now, how big did this manual get, and what generally type of things were in the manual? We had everything in our manual. Um, we had, uh, at first, it really was just sort of playing strategy and, and skills checkouts. Um, session limits, buy-ins, betting units, that sort sort of thing. But it included team rules like no drinking, how much sleep was required, what constituted a team trip versus just playing on our own. Um, and then it actually evolved into the to to really documenting the various characters that we'd play with, with small small bios on each of those characters, um, so we could kind of remember what our story was depending on where we were. And then we got to a point where we include a lot more information about the casinos themselves, like shift schedules and dealers who made payoff mistakes or whose penetration was particularly good. So the manual really became a compendium for our entire Blackjack lives. And, and we had fun with it, too. I mean, we, it was, we had it bound. It was black cover bound, um, kind of gave that clandestine feel to it. Um, but it was, we took it very seriously, and we put everything that we could possibly think of about our team and how we wanted that team run uh, in, that, in that manual. How did the um, – was there a, a uh, tipping point where you're, when you uh, crossed over uh, to betting a certain amount where you suddenly felt like the casinos uh, – Things changed because you you started betting over wh whether it was two hands of a thousand or whatever. Um, how did the casinos react to you when you started betting more? You know, purple chips. Well, that's a that's a good question because um, it depended on where we would be. So, you know, we started our careers on the East Coast really and spent a lot of time in Connecticut, Foxwoods, and Mohegan Sun, and that kind of action doesn't play well for people um, who look like us, frankly. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that is what, young and Caucasian? What is, what well, is us? Well, Caucasian, now? I don't know how young I am anymore, but yes. Well, I, I um, bet you do know how young you are anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, have a, I have about three more weeks before I hit a milestone, so I'm still hanging in there. But, um, yeah, it's it's... There's a lot more Asian gambling in the higher limit room in, at Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun, uh, whereas in Vegas, we could be on the on the main floor at the Bellagio and be betting, you know, a thousand dollar hand, and it really wouldn't raise a red flag. Um, so it, we we took that into consideration uh, when we decided where we, were, we would be playing, whether they would be able to take our action or not, take it well. Um, and we would make adjustments if we had to. So you might not be betting up to your bankroll in a certain casino because they may not handle that size bet. Yes, but we if more than that, we would avoid that. We would, we would take that into account in determining our schedule for the weekend. Um, and we I really see. started to avoid Connecticut altogether. It just wasn't, um, it wasn't conducive to, to where we were um, you know, with our team and in, in, in terms of our bankroll. So, you know, if you go to Atlantic City and you and you have $1,000 action at resorts or showboat, um, that's not going to be the same as if you have that same action at Borgata or Revel. 
same thing in Vegas, obviously, with, with some of the bigger strip hotels. Um, you just kind of have to know your place and, and figure out, you know, what would what's the best. I mean, we certainly want to look for, you know, good games, uh, good rules, good penetration, and also will they take our action. Right. Now the book is published by our friends at Huntington Press, also known as the Las Vegas Advisor. And the book may be obtained over the Internet at shoplva.com. If someone wanted to get in touch with you for either blackjack consulting or possibly as a financial advisor, how would they do that? Um, I appreciate that plug. Um, well, there there are a couple ways. Uh, right now, I I co-manage the site blackjackscience.com with Semyon Dukoc. Uh, he has produced a few di- of DVDs on um, intro to card counting and then some of his advanced strategies uh, which we sell and then I also offer the I, I kind of handle the the consultations and the the training sessions if people are interested in that I also have a Facebook page for my book the blackjack life um, if you just type that into the search bar in Facebook um, my page should come up and people are welcome to contact me with questions or concerns or anything that they want very good great one vast thing, we've got about two minutes. Um, all the techniques you describe in the books, I think I could learn, except mm-hmm. back counting two tables at once. Uh, counting two things at once sounds really tough to me, and especially back counting where you're trying to look around people and uh, not be too obvious as to what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, assuming you're you're great at counting and can do that in your blindfolded, how, yeah. how long does it take to do two counts at once? It, not long at all. It, it's actually quite quite easy. If if you are if you're a good counter, um, your compartment your, your ability to compartmentalize is probably pretty good. And uh, the only time there are two challenges with it. First of all, you kind of have to find two two tables that are starting around the same time so you look at you find a couple of dealers who are both shuffling up around the same point point in time the other thing is the challenge becomes when they're dealing at the exact same time and if if one of them scoops up the cards quickly you might miss it but most times it's staggered in some way and people are playing their hands and uh, there's time there's time to count one table uh, turn your head count the other and keep keep those counts separate. It's, um, it's actually not as hard as you might think. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. So thank you very much. This was, it was a, I recommend the book, and uh, thank you very much for sharing your time with us tonight. I appreciate the time. Thanks for having me. All right. Yeah, thanks, Nathaniel. Okay, Richard. Richard, what did we learn tonight? I was going to ask you that. Ah. <laughs> Well, I learned that he says counting two tables at once isn't that hard. It actually uh, is not. And back when I used to count cards, um, what, uh, my technique was to stand in between the two tables with my back to the pit as if I was looking out away. And um, I would put my hands in my pockets, and I would just – I had a little uh, code of, with my fingers where I could just keep the count on my fingers in both pockets, um, you know, so that – that way I could carry on a conversation sometimes as well. Um, it's, it's really not that difficult. So with, with five fingers or four fingers, you can, your code will allow you to keep numbers, you know, running count of plus or minus 15 or something. And yeah, you, yeah. Very good. That would be an interesting code to talk about some night. All right, yeah. Very good. So uh, let's talk about our sponsors. The South Point has more than 10,000 video poker games, returning more than 99%. This is more than anybody else. On Mondays through Thursdays, there's the opportunity to earn free lunch and dinner buffets for a modest amount of points, and you keep the points. So 600 points get you both, and or 300 points get you just the, the lunch. And uh, so that's a good deal. Uh, my next free semester of video poker classes will begin on uh, next week, five days from now, September 18th, Tuesdays at noon. First class is Jacks or Better. Uh, people 
have asked me what do they learn in class one of the big things they learn is that the strategies for every game is different it at least half of video poker players if they get a hand such as a pair of kings and a pair of threes and a seven will hold just the pair of kings in all the classes we teach except one pair uh you hold two pairs kings and threes and in one of the classes we teach you hold the threes and not the kings at all so players who just use the same strategy for all games frequently are doing it wrong so um you it's a good refresher course now at the palms the weekly drawings take place friday and saturday evenings this month the drawing demands some physicality the first person calls called gets to try to one chance to throw a football through a 16 inch diameter hole and he gets to choose whether to go from 10 feet 15 feet or 20 feet gets a bigger prize if he makes it from 20 feet the consolation prize is 20 25 dollars and making it from 20 feet is 7,000 so players called two through six uh, get 10% of whatever the player number one gets. The PEW play earn and win Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Tomorrow, Friday the 14th, is the last day for the first part of the month, and it's a do-it-yourself theme with uh, gift certificates, lows, or brooms, or certain tools. And the second p half of the month, starting Monday, uh, it's going to be a sports theme. So there's a gift card to Sports Authority and balls, uh, coolers, and other things you use when you do sportsy things. Next week's guest is going to be Mike Fields. Mike Fields is Vice President of VideoPoker.com, also known as Action Gaming, and they're one of our sponsors as well. These are the guys behind such games as Triple Play, Spin Poker, Quick Quads, and a slew of other video poker varieties. In three weeks, there's going to be a casino industry show here in Las Vegas called the Global Gaming Expo, G2E. Mike will be talking about the games his company be, will be releasing for the first time at G2E. All right, Munchkin. On your website, richardmunchkin.com, you recently wrote an article addressing the subject of if and when you're going to retire from gambling. Tell us about that. Well, I, um, um, I, I find it really was about, you know, people who don't know me and ask me what I do for a living. I used to always say writer. And, um, I, you know, I started sort of not liking that answer um, just because, you know, I'm not really writing that much. I'm certainly not making a living at writing. And, and uh, you know, yeah, I write on my blog, but, you know, that doesn't pay anything. So, uh, you know, I was thinking... Don't I know it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Never so mind. Go thinking, ahead. <laughs> maybe I should, you know, start saying, well, I'm, I'm retired or I'm semi-retired. Um, uh, but, but, but the actuality of it is, as far as playing goes... Um, you know, I, I realize that I don't think I will ever retire. I think I will be, as long as I'm ambulatory, I think I will still be out there playing. And I, I told a story there on my blog about, I met a, back in about 1980, I met a guy who was a blackjack legend named John Kretz. And this is a guy who made over a million dollars playing blackjack back in the 60s and 70s. And he went and had plastic surgery to change his face so that he could continue playing. Because um, remember back then there was only Nevada, and then Atlantic City had just opened. But, I mean, so, you know, they get to know you after a time when you only have one place to play. So he changed his face so he could go out and play. And I asked him, if you made a million dollars, why are you doing this? You know, and he said, what am I going to do, sit at home and watch TV? Like playing blackjack is what I do. It's who I am. Yep. And that made a lot of sense to me, and I, I think I'm the same way. I think I will always be out there, you know, grinding away. I mean, I, I no longer have to do it to make a living, but I still enjoy playing. So um, That pretty well sums it up for me as well. Uh, there, um, and if I am in a wheelchair, well, you know, hey, now I'm in a wheelchair, and I guess that has its advantages too. That yeah, if, especially if you have good eyesight, that can <laughs> yeah. be very useful. 
Um, have uh, sometimes on the internet on uh, like blackjack forums and stuff, they have messages saying, I'm going to be in Kansas City, I want to play blackjack, I want somebody to team up with, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, sometimes when you see this, other people speak up and say, this is a pretty bad idea to make such an announcement over the internet. Um, yeah, I just, um, uh, yeah, I, I just saw this kind of thing, and, and you know, one of my uh, advice to new players is don't listen to people on the internet. Uh, myself excluded, of course, but, um, you know, and I was just thinking because somebody said, you know, boy, don't team up with somebody you meet on the Internet. This is a good way to lose your money, you know. Um, And I I was just thinking about how much money I have actually made from meeting people over the Internet. Um, It's been just a tremendous, tremendous asset for me. I mean, uh you know, I've made some tremendous friends and made an awful lot of money um, because of people I just met on the Internet. And, you know, you meet them, and then you have to make a decision to decide whether to trust them or not. But, you know, as Tommy Hyland said in the interview I did with him, he said, we've made a lot of money by trusting people. Yeah, um, although you and I met officially 30 years ago, we most of our re-meeting was done over the internet and at least so far that's worked out well for both of us true <laughs> true true so um good all right so we actually have a list of more people who are going to be on the show that we're just working out dates um one is the holy rollers um colin uh-huh. from the holy rollers uh which is a uh blackjack team based on a Sunday school group. And, uh, <laughs> right. And actually, they have a website called blackjackapprenticeship.com. And um, Colin contacted me. He's coming here next week to interview me about something. I'm not sure what. I guess he has a podcast or something. So, Oh, uh, he's coming here? Like, in, are we talking about Vegas? Are we talking no, about... he's coming to my home. <laughs> oh, so, the uh, nerve of him. I want about service. <laughs> So uh, so anyway, he's willing to come on, and I said, well, we got to wait a few weeks because we're having Nathaniel on, and uh, and so we can't have two blackjack people uh, back to back. But uh, it'll be it'll be soon, and another sort of blackjack guy, Arnold Snyder, has just finished a novel. That yeah, he's got a new blackjack book that's supposed to have been out six months ago. That's not out yet. So, yeah. but I have a copy of the novel, at least in ebook. If ah. if you don't have one, Richard, you know how to get one. Right, right, uh, right. And you so, know, uh, we need Bob Nersessian on again too. He's it's been too long since he's been around. I agree, I agree. Uh, although I Nelson Rose recently had a, was a very good interview. It is definitely time to get Bob Nersessian back. And so, um, and there's been a few other guests that are in the books, and so we're going to uh, to be having them. Uh, this week we haven't had a lot of questions from uh, at gamblingwithanedge at gmail dot com, but um, if you do ask them, we do try to answer them on the air. By the way, I still have some uh, books of Steve Sears that he gave us to give away that we never gave away. So you might want to, uh, you and Shaq might want to come up with some uh, questions, uh, you know, for is, people to answer to get copies of that book. Is this the whale hunt in the desert? Yeah, yeah. The Deke, Deke Castleman book. Good. All right. So we have 10 seconds. I want everybody to go out and hit lots of royal flushes. And thank you for filling in, Munchkin. Sure. Happy to do it. Good night, everybody. Good. You've been listening to Gambling with an Edge with your hosts, Bob Dancer and Michael Shackleford. Archived versions of past shows may be found on BobDancer.com and WizardOfOdds.com. We welcome emails at gamblingwithanedge at gmail.com. Bob Dancer and Michael Shackelford are both on Facebook and welcome your input or questions. Our sponsors are the South Point Hotel, Casino, and Spa, the Palms Casino Resort, the website videopoker.com, and the website wizardofodds.com. Join us again next week for another Gambling with an Edge. <laughs>